The text for our sermon this Sexagesima Sunday is from the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 5, starting at verse 38 to verse 48. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you, and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? You, therefore, must be perfect, as your Heavenly Father is perfect. Here ends our reading. Let us pray. Almighty God, We pray that you would root us and found us in your love so that we would be able to understand with all the saints the length and width and height and depth of the love of Christ and to know this love which surpasses all understanding that we would be filled with all of your fullness. Amen. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be and abide with you all. Amen. The reading chosen for this Sexagesima Sunday, this uh, Sunday about 60 days out from Easter, is part of the Sermon on the Mount. In this text, Jesus is speaking about vengeance and love. Not romantic love like the world celebrates on St. Valentine's Day, as we will be doing this week, but that which you should have even for those who oppose you, who hate you, who mistreat you. Jesus quotes the Lex Talionis. We find this in the Old Testament after the Lord had given his Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai. And this thought, this saying is repeated in the book of Leviticus chapter 24 and in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 21. But the oldest quotation of this principle is found in the Code of Hammurabi from Babylon in the year 1730 before Jesus Christ. The goal of the Lex Talionis was to limit the punishment, to ensure justice. It was a way of saying that if somebody stole, you couldn't cut off his hand because that would be excessive. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. The punishment had to fit the crime. Gandhi transformed this law by saying eye for eye, and, to, and the world becomes blind. When you think about the conflicts between Israel and the Palestinians that rise up from time to time, or you think about the war in Ireland, in Northern Ireland, between 1968 and 1998, I remember that I was taught that it was a religious war between the Catholics and the Protestants. But really, the real motivation was that wasn't really so much about religion. It was a struggle 
for power between those who had come from England, who had immigrated into Ireland, whose origins were English, and those who were natively Irish. It wasn't religious as much as it was tribalism. And with this type of thought, the fighters got to the point where they didn't know why they were struggling, why they were warring against one another, but just that they had to attack the enemies. Often, those who suffer a great loss want revenge. And in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus doesn't make reference to the lex talionis as a principle that we should put into practice. He uses it to compare his teaching. You have heard it said, eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the evil one. Now, if you take seriously what Jesus says, you're going to realize that it's impossible. In preparing for this sermon, I read a number of commentaries, and they said that Jesus was using hyperbolic language. But let's take seriously what he says. If someone slaps you on the cheek, show them the other one. In this first example, you are clearly the victim. If someone slaps you and you can respond, you can do the same back to them. But Jesus says, don't hurt the other person. You should even be willing to suffer more. Or then you get to the case of a court case when you might be declared guilty, when you might actually be responsible for the act, and you're charged to give your undershirt, the one that's closest to your body. Jesus says that you should also give your outer garment. He's asking you to do more than just the bare minimum, especially if you've done wrong. And again, in the third example, you might neither be innocent nor guilty. You might just be wandering around and somebody sees you. Roman soldiers could ask people to carry their burden for them. The Israelites hated the Romans. And they, in no way, shape, or form, wanted to come to their, come to their aid. But Jesus again says, go over and above. Go two miles with them. Now, even if you don't come to, to bear, to come into these exact situations, you can understand what Jesus expects of his people. He wants his people to do more than what is demanded of them. Now, what does that look like in daily life? When I do marriage preparation with couples, I often ask the question, so what do you think about this marriage? Is it 50-50? That each person has to do their part? And quite often the couples say, exactly. And then I answer them that if they do that, their relationship won't last. It's going to fail. Because really, everyone has to give it their all. 100%. And it's not that each person contributes equally in the marriage relationship, but that each person does what they can for the well-being of the couple. The Christian understands the teaching not to seek revenge and to love. And we understand this through the lens of Christ. It's not that God asks something from us Christians that he himself is not ready and willing to do himself. The soldiers struck Jesus on the cheek and he turned the other cheek. They have cast lots for his garments and he gave them to him. Not that he couldn't stop. And when he couldn't carry the cross anymore, they made Simon of Cyrene carry it for him. Jesus went over and above what was necessary for your salvation, for the salvation of all mankind. And his death 
renders the law of retribution obsolete because all demands for the justice of God have been satisfied by the death of Christ. Now, that is not to say that the cross puts an end to the justice, justice system in this world. But it requires Christians not to seek revenge, but to put their trust in God's justice. God asks us to forgive those who have sinned against us. Because he has forgiven us first. In society, we often speak about rights. Now, historically, rights were rooted in not the, the will of the state, but they were recognized as coming from the creator. In the states, you talk about um, uh, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. In Canada, they talk about uh, peace, order, and good government. And here in France, there are um, all sorts of documents dating back to 1789 which talk about human rights. And there's the Declaration of Human Rights by the United Nation and the European Convention on Human Rights. These rights assure equality, justice, and liberty for people. But for you as a Christian, you can claim, I have the right to this or that. But really, any motivation for this not, should not be for egoism, for selfishness, but to protect those who are unable to defend themselves. How many people complain or, or um, go on strike saying, we have our rights. And if you believe that someone has sinned against your rights, has, has taken your rights from you, you want that person to be punished. You want them to suffer. You want justice. St. Paul writes to the Philippians. And I think it applies to our culture. All seek their own interests and not those of Jesus Christ. Philippians 2.21. But to these Christians, he says, may each one of you Rather than looking to his own interests, look out for those of other people. Jesus isn't wanting to promote unrighteousness and injustice, but he's calling you to go above and beyond, to do more than what is required or even asked of you, to act out of a true Christian love. How then should we understand when Jesus says, Give to the one who asks, and do not turn away from him who wants to borrow from you. Luther explains it this way. Christ isn't telling me to give my goods to whatever scoundrel crosses my path and to deprive my family and others who are in need that I am called to help. And then to myself suffer and become a burden on others. He doesn't say that we should give and loan to all, but to him who asks us. That is to say, to the one who is truly in need. Jesus explains this further by comparing, to, or by, by suggesting a second comparison. The other teachers were saying that you are to love your neighbor and to hate your enemy. Now, we don't know where that is written, but apparently it was being said at the day and age of Jesus. But Jesus goes against that. He says, love your enemies and bless those who curse you and do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who mistreat you and who persecute you. Again, the commentaries can say that Jesus is being hyperbolic, that he's going way out there the way he's talking. Because none of us can really do that. But the very first catechism, which dates to the end of the first century, it's a book called the Didache, explains, but you... Love those who hate you, and you will not have any enemies. 
by doing good to others, by blessing those who curse you, by praying for others. God changes your heart towards them. And moreover, those who receive your goodness can, they also, have a change of heart. First, towards you, but more importantly, towards God. And so I ask you, who do you need to forgive? Who do you have difficulty loving? Someone at work that you don't appreciate? Someone at school who is um, uh, harassing you or uh, teasing you? Maybe you have a problem with a roommate. Maybe you have a problem with a child or someone else in your family who doesn't respect you or who mistreats you. It's hard to love them, to pray for them, to bless them. In the course of our lives, every one of us has interactions with those who are difficult to love. Now, does the fact that someone is hard to love mean that that frees us from all responsibility to actually love them? No. Why does Jesus ask you to love your enemies? Because he loves them. Jesus gives an example of the goodness of God by explaining that he does good to all. For truly, he causes the sun to rise on the evildoer and the good. He causes rain to fall on the just and the unjust. You see, there's the example of God at work, being kind. And it it follows that Christians should act in the same way. Now, it's not a challenge to love those who do good to you, who pay you back, who give you back the things they borrow, who are kind and and soft-spoken. Everyone does that, Jesus says. Even the worst people in society at, at the time, the tax collectors. He says, can't you do better than them? And so finally he says, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Now, a lot of times people think this is a demand for moral perfection, to not commit sins. But the word that is translated by be perfect is linked to a Greek word teleos, which means that you're bringing something to its goal. You're bringing something to completion. By using this word, Jesus is saying that God has nothing that hasn't been resolved. His grace isn't conditional. God is perfectly righteous in and of himself. And all, every single sin has been forgiven. And he welcomes everyone to himself. And so Jesus is calling you to be merciful, to not take out and seek revenge, to love those who have nothing to offer you, to do good to those who mistreat you. And yes, if you've done wrong, to do what you can to be at peace with that person and to pay back the person for what you've done wrong. Now, you know that it's not in doing these things that you become perfect. You are children of your Father by faith in Christ. But he calls you to a love, a love that is lacking in nothing. He calls you to his complete and total love, and he invites you to himself and to his love for you. In the name of Jesus, amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all of our understanding, keep your hearts and your minds steadfast in Christ Jesus, unto life everlasting. Amen.